The Milky Way Galaxy with Joe Pesh, astrophysicist at the National Science Foundation. Hello and welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. Thousands of centuries ago on the ancient plains of Africa, our most distant hominid ancestor looked upward, embracing the pitch dark night sky above their heads. Cultures around the globe made up stories of a bright band of light which ran across the inky darkness. Little could any person imagine the Milky Way was composed of hundreds of billions of stars, let alone comprehending the notion of a trillion galaxies permeating throughout the cosmos. Later on in the show, we're going to talk with Dr. Joe Pash, astrophysicist at the National Science Foundation, talking about this supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Now, in 1610, the same year that Henry Hudson became the first European to see Hudson Bay, what a coincidence, right? Go, Henry. Astronomer Galileo Galilei pointed his telescope toward the Milky Way. In doing so, he became the first person to clearly see individual stars within this diffuse band of light. Go, Galileo. For centuries, we believe the stars of the Milky Way held the entirety of everything in the universe. Now, the Andromeda Galaxy, the nearest large galaxy to the Milky Way, is visible with the naked eye. In fact, it is the most distant object which can be seen by humans without a telescope. However, this blurry patch of light in the night sky was long thought to be a local nebula of gas and dust. Now, in 1920, the New York Times lambasted rocket pioneer Robert Goddard, saying he seems to lack the knowledge ladled out daily in high schools. Undeterred by such sentiment from an anonymous columnist, science somehow trudged forward that same year with the Great Debate. This contest of ideas between Harlow Shapley and Heber Curtis pondered the nature of spiral nebula, like Andromeda seen in space. Shapley held on to the old school notion, believing that, that these bodies were fairly small lying within the Milky Way. Curtis argued that spiral galaxies were instead island universes like our own galaxy. Spoiler alert, Curtis was right. Go he, Bert. Today, we know galaxies come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. One thing nearly every galaxy has in common, though, is found near its core, a supermassive black hole. Sagittarius A star, the body near the center of the Milky Way, holds on to more than 4 million times as much mass as our sun. Recently, astronomers using the Event Horizon Telescope, a global network of radio telescopes, imaged Sag A star in detail for the first time ever. We talk with Dr. Joe Pesh, astrophysicist at the National Science Foundation, about this exciting new look at our local supermassive black hole. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we're delighted to be joined by Joe Pesh. He is an astrophysicist at the National Science Foundation and specializes in studying supermassive black holes, just like that one at the center of our own Milky Way. Welcome to the show, Joe. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very honored to be here with you. Thank you so much. So for those who may be new to the subject, can you just give us a general look uh, at, at Sagittarius A star, the black hole at the center of our Milky Way, and what makes it so cool? So not unique, and, and this is the, the fun part of black holes that 
we've learned over the decades that uh, these so-called supermassive black holes, to distinguish them from the stellar-sized black holes that, that are much less massive, the supermassive black holes appear to be found in the centers of every galaxy. Uh, wherever we look, we find these big uh, monster black holes. And they range in millions of times the mass of the sun. Ours is on the small end. It's about 4 million times uh, as massive as the sun and all the way up to billions of times the mass of the sun. Now, you know, the, the one in uh, Sagittarius A star, the one in the, in the middle of our galaxy, is special because it's ours. And uh, more than that, we've been studying it. It's one of the few supermassive black holes that we can hope to be able to image directly. And in fact, we did that. And, and so last week, those observations were released. And I think that's in addition to, you know, our personal black hole, this is one of the few that we're, we, we can hope to be able to uh, see up close and, and personally. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Mm. And as you mentioned, of course, it's absolutely, you know, everyone was recently, uh, a few weeks ago by the time this airs, um, was delighted by, you know, new images taken by, by the uh, Earth Horizon Telescope as well as associated observatory. So what makes this finding so important? Well, so, so fundamentally, you know, black holes are enigmatic objects and they're very difficult to observe uh, for the reason that they are called black holes. They absorb everything, including photons of light. And so, you know, light that falls in doesn't escape. So by definition, we cannot see them. And in fact, this observation we're not observing the black hole because again, by definition, we can't. We're observing the shadow of the black hole on its, on its uh, near environment. So number one, this observation is important because it's giving us new insight into black holes. It's allowing us to confirm directly that there is a black hole, uh, in this case, Sagitta Sagittarius A star. We've, we've long known about black holes. Well, we've known about black holes for over 100 years, uh, theoretically from the time of Einstein, of course. And in the last, oh, 50 or 60 years, we have strong evidence that they exist, but that's always been indirect. And so this observation, uh, and the one in 2019, of uh, the, the supermassive black hole in the galaxy called uh, M87, this is the first time that we've been able to image that region near the black hole directly. And it's, allowing us to prove that our, our uh, understanding of black holes is, is pretty good. And, you know, and, and, and we've been right all along and Einstein has been correct. Uh, so the objects themselves, you know, studying more directly the object themselves because they are one of these mysterious objects in, in, in nature, in astronomy, uh, they're important because they may form the nucleus, these big ones may form the nucleus around which galaxies form, but in any case, they're there and having some sort of impact on the galaxy that surrounds them. In addition, because these are regions of extreme gravity, regions of gravity that are, that's so extreme that we cannot reproduce that here on Earth, we can use these environments as laboratories to study other things, other laws of nature. Uh, in a way that we wouldn't be able to anywhere else, certainly not on Earth in, in our laboratories. So we use the, the region around the black hole as a cosmic laboratory and making observations like this that, that, uh, that was produced by the Event Horizon Telescope um, allows us to study fundamental laws of, of physics. 
in a way that we wouldn't be able to do. So, so there's multiple approaches to this object that give us information uh, about the object and about uh, more broadly about our understanding of the universe. Absolutely incredible. So one of the things that I find absolutely fascinating is the fact, like you alluded to, that, this, that our supermassive black hole is so puny compared to others. Uh, Andromeda, the Andromeda galaxy is a little bit larger than us, but it has a supermassive black hole more than 50 times larger. Why is Sagittarius A star, Sag A star, so, so small? Any ideas? Well, uh, we can speculate. I, I, you know, we, we don't necessarily know the answer to that. I can give you some scenarios yeah. why that may be. Um, and, and, you know, these, these are a population of objects that, that have a range of, of masses. Now, the, the, the fundamental question about supermassive black holes is, number one, how do they form? How do they get so large? And certainly, black holes can merge. And we see the stellar-sized black holes merging. We can't yet observe supermassive black holes uh, merging, but we suspect that that's the case. So. You know, you have galaxies that collide with each other and their individual supermassive black holes find their ways to the, to the center of the nucleus of the galaxies and they merge and combine and their mass grows. But, you know, did they start out uh, stellar size with five to ten times the mass of the sun and then over the, the, the eons uh, grow into these big monsters? Did they form as big monsters to begin with in the very early days of the universe? We, we don't know that. So that's a big open question. And then number two, uh, do they, again, I, as I said earlier, do they form the nucleus around which the galaxy grows or does the galaxy come first? So does the supermassive come first and then the galaxy grows around it? Or does the galaxy come first and then the supermassive black hole builds up and falls to the center of the galaxy? We don't yet know that know the answer to that. Uh, new instruments coming online uh, will, will help us understand that. The, the observatory behind me, uh, the ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, which was instrumental in this observation of Sag A star, is making observations of uh, uh, supermassive black holes in the very early universe. James Webb Space Telescope will, will help us understand this. So, you know, we have these black holes that we don't know how they built up in size. Uh, were they born that way, you know, the, the way they are today? The, probably to some extent, but they also increased in size over, over uh, again, the age of the, the, the universe. Our black hole is indeed puny, uh, you know, compared to other black holes, the supermassive black holes. And it's probably that it's feeding absorbing mass and material and, and other things uh, at a very low rate. Mm. And that is probably due to the dynamics of our galaxy, right? So we have these small satellite galaxies that occasionally fall into our galaxy and get consumed, as it were, by our galaxy. Those stars uh, add to the Milky Way galaxy's stellar component. The gas and dust that's inside of them might eventually find its way into the center of our galaxy and then fall on to Sag A star, causing it to increase in size. But I think the smallness of, that, of our supermassive black hole is an indicator that our galaxy has been relatively quiet in this regard over its history. Um, stuff falls into the center of the nucleus, feeds the supermassive black hole there, but at a very low rate. In other galaxies, that may be different. And so in other maybe bigger galaxies, M87 that I, that I mentioned earlier, that has a six and a half billion solar mass black hole. That's a much, much larger galaxy. And one can imagine that based on the environment it's in, it's absorbing uh, other companion galaxies and their supermassive black holes are, are, are causing the, the, you know, the big black hole in M87 to grow much more rapidly than, uh, than, our, than our supermassive black hole. So I think that's probably what it is. It's just the history of our galaxy. Hmm. And some people, when, they, when this new image uh, behind me came out, um, a lot of people who may not have been 
And a lot of people thought, oh, geez, this, is, this image came out a couple of years ago, confusing it with the image in M87. But of course, Sag A star is much, much closer to us. So can you give us a little rundown on why it is we got images of one so far away compared to our local, our local one first? That, that's an excellent question. And uh, number one, it's, you know, to, to, to your point, they kind of look alike, right? Mm -hmm. And if we put them side by side, we can see some differences. And, and over time, we'll see differences as well. But they look alike. And, and, and that is um, not surprising because that's what theory is telling us, that these black holes should look alike. And so that observation in, in its own, you could look at that and say, well, it's boring. It doesn't look any different. You know, they're identical. But that's really quite good because it's confirming our understanding of black holes. They should look very similar. And in fact, they do. Now, more to your point, uh, why these two particular black holes? And the answer is that these are incredibly difficult observations to make. In, in fact, these are some of, some of the most, they are the most difficult observations that humans have ever made astronomically. Uh, the black hole image behind you and, and M87 that, that uh, came out a couple of years uh, ago uh, are the highest resolution images that humans have ever produced. And f from, a, from a, a physical perspective, we're looking at an object that on the sky is 50 micro arc seconds. And an arc second is a measure of, of, of angle on the sky. And, you know, that, that may be uh, meaningful or more likely it's meaningless. It's kind of meaningless to me. I know what that means, but, you know, it's just a number. It's the equivalent of observing an orange or a, a donut, more or less the same size, on the surface of the moon. So if we put an orange on the surface of the moon and we sit back here on Earth with a telescope, we would be able to see, with, with the Event Horizon Telescope, we would be able to see that orange on the surface of the moon. That's the equivalent of this observation of these black holes. Wow. M87, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I, yeah, okay. yep. you know, you, because you could ask why, why these two uh, black mm -hmm. holes, yeah, if yeah, every yeah. galaxy has a black hole. So they're very small, right? The, the black hole, Sagittarius A star, the black hole in our galaxy is small, massively, in mass, but it's nearby. It's only 26,000 light years away. M87, on the other hand, is 55 million light years away, but it's much more massive, six and a half billion times uh, uh, the mass of the sun. Interestingly, just based on how black holes, uh, uh, how big they are on the sky compared to their mass, that big massive M87, even though it's further away, is almost exactly the same size on the sky as Sagittarius A star. And they are, in fact, large enough, both of those, uh, that we can observe them with our instruments. We cannot yet observe other supermassive black holes because they're further away, they're smaller or whatever, but, but fundamentally they're smaller on the sky. And our technology, we're, we're employing bleeding edge technology here to observe these two objects. That's what we can do today. Maybe in the future we'll be able to do more objects. Hmm. So we have a listener question for you. Devin from Brattleboro, Vermont, would like to know, what is the ultimate fate of Sagittarius A star? So Sagittarius A star is going to be sitting there in the middle of, of the Milky Way. Uh, occasionally a star or a gas cloud, a dust cloud, will wander too close. And by the way, you know, these things are spatially small, right? So Sagittarius A star is about the size of our solar system, even though it, it's, it's massive. Uh, stuff that falls into the black hole needs to be very, very close. So, you know, one question may be, what happens to us? Well, we're safe out here 26,000 light years away. But occasionally, you know, stuff will wander by too close to Sagittarius A star, and it will, it will fall in to the black hole and the black hole's mass will increase. And so slowly over time, it will continue to increase. Um, it's big enough that that's basically the future. It'll stay large uh, for all intents and purposes, you know, for, 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 the, for the rest of time if we have a universe that continues uh, infinitely. 
Now, having said that, and you mentioned the Andromeda galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy is, is a large galaxy that's, that's near us, and both the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy are falling towards each other. And some four or five billion years in the future, we will collide. And again, almost certainly the, the, our supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star, and the black hole in the middle of an, the Andromeda galaxy will merge and coalesce. And so the result then will be a much larger uh, black hole. It, it, it will no longer be Sagittarius A star, I suppose, because we'll have a different galaxy after that, after that event. But in fact, um, uh, it, it will be a much larger object after you know, the two have, have merged. And there will continue to be mergers. So some of our companion, uh, smaller companion galaxies will be absorbed by the Milky Way and by that product of the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxy, and, and the black hole will continue to, to increase in size over time. Hmm. So interesting to think about. And finally, what are the next steps for you and astronomy and instruments to help study Sagittarius A star and other supermassive black holes? And how the heck does Webb come into this? We, new instruments come online, uh, are coming online, new telescopes and, and new instruments that go in those telescopes. So they will allow us to observe the region around Sagittarius A star with, with better clarity. Um, stuff is moving and, and falling into the black hole. And so we hope to be able to observe that and get movies of, of the material swirling around the black hole as it falls in. Uh, we can study the stars that are orbiting the black hole. In fact, this led to Nobel Prize. Uh, the, the study of, of the stars that are orbiting Sagittarius A star that, that allow us to understand relativity in, in a better way. And uh, James Webb, because of its observations in the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum, will allow us to observe objects in the very early days of the universe. And some of those objects are going to be supermassive black holes in the galaxies that surround them. And so we'll be able to understand in that question that I brought up before, you know, how do these big supermassive black holes form uh, and, and what happens to the galaxy uh, that surrounds them. And so that, you know, we're looking forward to that. And, and it's, a, it's a golden age of astronomy and, and I think we'll be going from strength to strength. Fabulous. Well, thanks so much for doing the show, Joe. It was fabulous talking with you. And that was uh, Joe Pesh, astrophysicist at National Science Foundation. Thank you. Galaxies are generally classified into four main types, spiral, elliptical, irregular, and my personal favorite, peculiar galaxies. I identify with those quite a bit, if I'm going to be honest. The Milky Way is considered to be a barred spiral galaxy, a spiral galaxy with, well, bars. That's the type made of stars and not, you know, milliways. We believe our own family of stars looks much like the barred spiral galaxy UGC 12158, nearly 400 million light years from home. Our local family of stars is ancient, first forming more than 13 and a half billion years ago. This makes the Milky Way roughly three times older than the Earth and Sun, and not much younger than the universe itself. That means the Milky Way has been here a long, long time, but nothing lasts forever. More than four billion years from now, the Milky Way will collide in with the Andromeda Galaxy, the big neighbor next door. This will, this will merge the two galaxies together into a newly, oddly shaped mega galaxy called Milkdromeda. Bear with us, it's a working title. We have billions of years before we need to commit to a name, okay? Join us next week on the Cosmic Companion as we take a look at robots in space. We're gonna be talking with Jason McKenna. He is Director of Educational Strategy at VEX Robotics. Make sure to join us starting on the 14th of June. Missing that episode would not compute. I agree.
Check out all of our episodes at thecosmiccompanion.tv or visit us at the Cosmic Companion anywhere online. Claire Skies.